Uh, am I loud and clear? Yes, sir. Good morning. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for the opportunity to join these esteemed uh, speakers and colleagues from all over the world. It's an international audience. Um, my case is going to be fairly short, and I'm very impressed by all the myriad of cases that have been presented. The skills have been excellent. Uh, my case is relatively simple, but um, basically illustrates the impact of the pot balloon within a bifurcation lesion, uh, where I employed the technique of a provisional uh, strategy uh, up front due to the nature of the case, but also that is my practice to go for provisional initially and, and obviously upgrade from there. So I, I work at in Cape Town, and Cape Town is this um, place in the bottom part of Africa. It's quite a sunny area, very windy, and uh, obviously with climate change, you can have four, four seasons in one day. Uh, I operate at Life Vincent Pilotti Hospital, quite a large cardiac center in uh, Cape Town. We've got at least five labs operating in the metropole, um, a huge population of, um, of, of patients with coronary disease, a, huge, a large eastern population uh, with the associated genetics, um, large sort of uh, patients with lots of with, 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 uh, European descent as well, with all the genetics involved there as well. So lots of coronary disease. I've got no conflicts. So just to illustrate my approach to bifurcation uh, PCI, I'm not too sure what the extended audience is. Are there going to be fellows involved here as well? But complexity must always be appreciated um, and not to ad hoc um, go into these uh, lesions without the experience and with the necessary equipment and insight into what can go wrong and what must be done in order to bail out in case things go wrong. The precision is required. A number of speakers have alluded to the importance of imaging uh, in PCI involving these complex calcified lesions in the left main stem, but also in the bifurcations. The imaging is especially important. I am a, an avid supporter of OCT, but obviously IVIS also is very part of my, my armamentarium. Um, in bifurcation PCI, one must always be mindful of the additional metal uh, that is uh, being, uh, being used. And then, of course, as our previous speakers have noted, uh, the importance of instant restenosis and the management thereof subsequently, and obviously the heightened risk of thrombosis. But with the modern equipment available, uh, lots of the uh, incidences of instant restenosis can be minimized. And of course, once operating in a bifurcation uh, with additional stents, unnecessary stents, you increase the MACE rate. The strategy is very important to success, and always a good strategy, if possible, is to start with a provisional strategy. So my my case is really uh, involves an acute, uh, in, an acute sort of case. Uh, this gentleman was extremely ill on a ventilator, uh, required sort of urgent uh, intervention, and unfortunately there were some modalities that I would love to have adopted, but I think because of time constraints and just to get him out of the cath lab and to stabilize him, we kind of moved quite quickly. But he's a 78 year old with a range of cardiovascular risk factors. He's hypertensive, uh, diabetic, hypercholesterolemic, also an ex-smoker. Um, had presented to hospital with um, prostate-related problems, urinary retention, but also had a, a lower respiratory tract infection, <clears throat> which required management. Then while in the ward, had become acutely hemodynamically unstable and was noted with ST elevation in the anterior leads. Now, because this, uh, this process happened in a peripheral hospital away from the cath lab, uh, he was given lysis. And uh, subsequently, his ST segments settled, but he was transferred across to um, our center where his ST segments had settled, but he was now ventilated, uh, intubated, obviously, and, um, and in pulmonary edema. He was essentially on a ventilator, and, and, but responded well to Lasix, was treated for pneumonia, developed acute on chronic renal failure, but uh, with recurrent pulmonary edema that was present in the ICU, uh, and in the setting of his poor LV function, extensive, extensive anterior wall motion problems, um, the only option for him was to go and uh, attempt revascularization, which was uh, first discussed with the whole heart team because obviously a very critical multi-organ failure affected patient now needed to be salvaged. So this was his ECG, a left bundle branch block type pattern. And um, my angiographic findings initially we, I, I accessed him by the, by the uh, right radial um, access. I, we do 98% radial access, and that was an uncomplicated access. So this was the imaging. As you can see, quite a poorly contractile left ventricle. 
um, this was the this was the left. Uh, sorry, let me just go back on that image. So essentially, this is the the left main stem. It doesn't seem to be. Let me just play it for you. So the left main stem is short. Uh, it's got quite a long segment of proximal left anterior descending artery uh, visible, with an angulated proximal to mid left anterior descending artery into a mildly diseased mid vessel and then tapering into a perfused distal vessel. One can see there's reasonable perfusion. There's a large diagonal which comes off. Then uh, within the proximal circumflex, there's a calcified, uh, severely um, affected uh, segment of, of disease within the proximal uh, circumflex, extending into, uh, into the AV circumflex, but also into the obtuse marginal one. So in essence, uh, this was a subtotal occlusion, um, which we will see a bit later on. Looking at the, um, at the allocranial projection, um, you can appreciate the, the vessels. And of note, the, there's a CTO involving the right coronary. So he's got extensive triple vessel coronary disease, which, um, which was a very, very, very bad um, situation in his case, especially since he is now so s systemically ill and required all the perfusion that he could get. So that was the right coronary vessel. So up front, um, discussing strategy, I really wanted to wanted to address this lesion um, as timelessly as possible, but also in a very simplistic way. Didn't want to complicate things. One could appreciate the levels of calcium within that mid-left anterior descending artery, which I felt was the culprit, obviously given the initial presentation, but obviously taking into account all the other lesions, this multiple CTOs uh, visible there. Didn't think he was a candidate for surgery at this stage. I think he was so ill, he needed to be stabilized acutely. And uh, so I, adopted a strategy of provisional stenting within the within the LAD. I realized that we were going to have to be using long stents given the um, the length of the of the lesion. Essentially the you know quite a long lesion I was potentially going to have to use two stents within the proximal to mid left anterior descending artery. The question was whether I would be attack uh, be uh, targeting the side uh, branch the the diagonal branch which you saw coming on off the mid and you will see that vessel in a second again when I rehash re the slides. But essentially, uh, there are multiple trials which have indicated um, various indications for, for, for going for a, for a two, upfront two strength uh, stain strategy. As mentioned in his case, I wanted to keep things um, extremely simple. I, will, I appreciated the fact that there was some disease involving the proximal diagonal, probably more than 10 millimeters, was quite calcified, fortunately not extremely angulated, and there was certainly no <clears throat> retroflexed angle to that diagonal. So I thought <clears throat> that accessing the diagonal would be quite easy should anything have gone wrong. So I still kept with a two, with a, with a, with a provisional stem strategy. So my strategy in him was, as I mentioned, the radial axis. I used the glide sheath slender. Um, I used an EBU for optimal support because backup would have been needed through such an angulated, highly calcified lesion. Um, I I employed the strategy of obviously wiring the diagonal and the left anterior descending artery, and then I also anticipated plaque modification. May have had to go and use the rotablator, and of course maybe even IVL. Imaging, as I mentioned, would be crucial in this um, sort of case, given the length of the lesion, but also the calcification, and also to the to assess the nature of the plaque, um, the calcium angle, depth, and 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 distance. And of course, um, I was mindful of the renal impairment um, in using a modality like OCT. But um, I felt that, you know, with minimization of the of 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 of, um, of of imaging of not imaging but rather cine images with contrast, I could still have time for OCT. But I decided on a stenting strategy and that was provisional. So essentially, this was my this was the the, the wiring. I <clears throat> I managed to wire the the vessels using field the FC wires, and um, quite a difficult wiring within the angulation of the mid LED. Uh, the diagonal wire um, was easy to 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 to, to deploy. So um, with a series of CTO balloons, I'm um, not mentioning any names, but going from a one to 1.5 to 2.5 um, millimeter uh, balloon strategy, up uh, adjusting the balloon, um, I eventually managed to open up the mid LED, which was done quite effectively and um, surprisingly surprisingly well. Looking at the, uh, eventually I was able to to further dilate with a three by 30 millimeter non-compliant balloon across the extent of the lesion, and that was that, that was was quite amazing given the given the uh, the nature of the calcium. So essentially, I wasn't able to pass the OCT catheter up front because of the fact that he was 
it was it was a very angulated lesion, extremely tight, couldn't pass any equipment through. And um, as we were going through with the case, he started to go into into uh, varying degrees of pulmonary edema, and the anesthetist needed to get involved, obviously. And we just had to make um, had to speed up with the with the process. Of course, my concern now was the was the diagonal branch. Um, would I need to address that rather sooner than later? And I was still quite hopeful about my provisional stent strategy. So ballooning all the way up into the proximal lesion, and then um, as you can see, you know the LED and the LED and partially the circumflex was perfusing the distal right coronary. So we essentially, with any balloon inflation, he was getting minimal coronary perfusion. So um, I felt that my that that I, I was well dilated with my balloon, and it, I decided to 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 just opt, opt to get some some flow down those vessels, and opted to go and put my put a three by forty eight millimeter synergy down, and um, dilate that effectively. One can appreciate the um, the shoulders of calcium present there, tram tracking, in other words. But I was quite impressed with how we could deploy this. These the proximal stent edge wasn't 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 effective, and I decided to to stent with another stent, um, a three a three point five by fifteen millimeter, and that um, overlapped there with with a good result. However, I was I was very concerned about the extent of calcification that was present within this particular particular vessel. And I decided to to use the pot balloon to um, optimize flow down the diagonal and utilizing the the benefit of the minimization at the shoulder uh, region uh, to prevent coronal shift into that diagonal because I had not uh, predilated the diagonal, obviously concerned about dissection and calcification, and obviously the chance of making this uh, case more complicated than what it what it what it was. So with minimal uh, compliance. This balloon is very effective. It's got this rectangular shape, which has been discussed multiple times. I felt that um, utilizing the balloon, and in fact, this balloon was dilated across the vessel, that uh, the folding was actually quite good. But as uh, the prof said, uh, I went from distal to proximal and was able to to fold with 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 with, with gentle traction and pulling back, uh, and the balloon did not stick. So with with a, with a with a with a balloon technique, particularly within the proximal, I was able to gauge the the proximal edge. And utilizing obviously this diagram, which has been discussed um, at length during this presentation, accurate expansion within the proximal edge, utilizing taking the example of this three millimeter balloon, uh, the minima the minimal uh, shoulder distance, which um, which I felt was very novel, and I couldn't believe this hasn't been thought of in the past, but it's, it's it makes so much sense from a technical perspective, and that was used proximally. And I was able to to get accurate stent expansion within the proximal segment, uh, with um, with less sort of anxiety and fear that I would dissect all the way into the left main stem. So essentially, I towards the end of the case, I was I was comfortable that um, I had three TIMI three flow in all vessels. Um, given the given the complexity of the of this patient and how sick he was, I decided to to accept the results. I also noticed that there was a there was reasonable, there was excellent stent expansion, particularly on my stent boost. And, um, you know, I hadn't, I, 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 I basically didn't go for imaging. Where I'm, perhaps I should have. And that's one of the criticisms of my case. But I was comfortable given the high pressure inflations over four, four millimeters uh, diameter. And I took it all the way up to about 20, 24 atmospheres in dilating the proximal edge that I was comfortable that the this, this stent was well deployed. And given what I started off with, I was quite, quite happy. So, I felt that this was a reasonable angiographic outcome. My intention is to most likely bring him back for to to well my intention is to bring him back to sort out the circumflex and then hopefully the CTO on the right. Uh, but the the aim here was to get perfusion into the left anterior descending artery. I felt that the residual lesions were all chronic and that um and then this that this was the most urgent case to at least get him off a ventilator. Unfortunately, I used uh, two stents. It was a lengthy lesion, highly calcified anatomy. OCT initially would not pass, and then, given the nature of the case, we just wanted to get get started. And as the prof also said earlier on, you know, maybe we just kind of anxiety kicked in, and we just needed to move quickly. Um, I didn't imaging, but 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 certainly with the with the next angiographic sitting, I will I will pass either an IVOS or an OCT down to assess our stent expansion and optimize where required. But more more impressively. Um, Particularly with extensive ballooning and 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 with a pot balloon at the level of the uh, bifurcation of the diagonal and um, with minimal carina shift because of the shoulder distance, 
fortunately, there was not much encroach, encroachment um, into the flow of the diagonal. So I still preserved the Timmy 3 flow. I don't believe that the ostium was at all perfect, but at least I had flow down the ostium and didn't require a second stent. Uh, in this particular case, given the angle, either culotte um, or potentially a T-stent strategy. But Timmy 3 flow down all vessels using this provisional bifurcation technique. Um, in this case, I was impressed by the by the, the high pressures that I, I went with this particular balloon and uh, probably off label, but I, I could have even reached up to 28 atmospheres in this patient. I was very comfortable using the balloon at the proximal edge, highly calcified. Um, also given the fact that I'd already extended the length of my stent, um, there was obviously minimal room for exceeding, exceeding the stent edge. I felt that with multiple inflations, um, I was still able to deliver quite a good uh, balloon expansion and, 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 and deliverable and trackable um, component to that balloon was preserved, I felt. And I was eventually able to pass a long stent without a problem, even you know, using this balloon in the pre-dilatation phase as well. So no rotor or IVL needed in this case eventually, but I will do a, a final OCT at, at, at his interval uh, procedure and to see what, what the result was and would there be in, any need for further tweaking of this case. But a quite a sick gentleman wanted to keep the case as simple as possible, had a very deliverable balloon with minimal shoulders, and I think it made the case so much more easier and pleasant. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I would accept any criticisms, And but one of the main criticisms I put out there is that imaging should have been used.